Hello everyone, my name is Gitika Gorski and today I'm very honored and excited to be featuring a very special space champion, Miss Yulia Akashiva. She is currently a PhD student in radiation protection and human space flight, and she describes herself in no particular order as a feminist, communicator, debate coach, aerospace engineer, scientist, advocate for all gender equality, diversity and human rights advocate, dancer, TEDx speaker, and above all, a human space flight and explore, exploration of Mars enthusiast. As you can see, she's very passionate about many different things, but they all connect to her love for space at the end of the day. She spends most of her time volunteering and working with the Space Generation Advisory Council, where she currently is the Diversity and Gender Equality Project Group team member and co-lead. She also started two TikTok channels trying to reach out to a broad audience about space and empower people to find their voices. Previously, she was a student intern at the European Space Agency, and she has many other incredible experiences under her belt, and I can't wait to learn more about them as well as share her story with you all today. Ms. Akasheva, thank you so much for taking your time to inspire the next generation. Welcome to this channel. Thank you so much, Ruli. Thank you for having me. Yeah, you know, before we get started into understanding what really inspired your passion and enthusiasm for space, could you first share a little bit more about your typical day? How does it usually run? Yes, yeah, so I have several typical days, I'd say. I don't just have one uh, day which like repeats, <laughs> but I do try to keep some things that I do every day. So for example, I have like a sort of morning routine to jumpstart my day like a little exercise not nothing too much just to really help me get going uh that usually happens in the morning and then i do walk my dog in the morning during the day that's these are the constants and for the rest it kind of runs on a maybe a weekly basis or it changes from month to month because as you mentioned i, I am involved in a, a number of things so that schedule fills up like one or two weeks in, ahead in advance so it's like that it changes but of course, I do spend uh, most of my time doing the work for my PhD. Also, I do work a lot for Space Generation Advisory Council. That means a lot of meetings on Zoom, a lot of research <laughs> on my own. And I try to fit that around the day pretty much when I can, really. Um, so I guess my schedule is changing <laughs> depending on the needs. Uh, but in the evening, I also like to maybe do some little exercise or talk to uh, friends and family for sure. That's a big part of my day. And then unwind, uh, either trying to learn something new. Uh, I do try to read in the evening before going to bed. And uh, yeah, also watch uh, some shows and stuff like Netflix is also part of that day to unwind and uh, kind of disconnect. I think it's important we do that. 100%. I think it's so awesome that you were able to share all these different aspects that are normal and you still have such a busy schedule and you're so a part of so many different things. Of course, you can, you know, I feel like I could relate with, you know, the Netflix part or talking with family members and just trying to find that time where you can unwind from, you know, the huge day that just happened. And I'm also, you know, when I, you're talking about SJC, I'm really like curious about what got you into SJC because you have such a strong solid role you know what made you attracted to joining SJC and you know taking that leadership role of being a, a co-lead of the diversity group yeah so it started with me attending an event in Paris a local event called SG France the first French event meaning the community gathered together and we discussed things about a certain topic back then it was lunar exploration and I was already invested in that in my sort of academic or professional career let's say so I came to share my opinion and I was just amazed at the fact that this community gathers and then we discuss what we think should be done in space and then eventually this leads to recommendations which are then proposed to the global community of SGC to the partners of SGC and since SGC has an observer status at the UN COPUS once a year we do present these recommendations to the big table at the UN so at first I was really just amused at the whole process behind the thinking behind it. And then also, of course, just like taken away by the community because it's young professionals and students, everyone is so energetic, dynamic, everyone is passionate about space. And I love that we all came from different backgrounds already like back then. So that was in 2019 for me, 
the first encounter at my table, I had a person from business background, a person from purely like, let's say, theoretical physics, uh, me who comes from the background of using regolith and like sort of living on the moon, uh, people who were like purely academic and more like economic background. And we all were, we were all discussing basically what to do with the moon, with lunar exploration. And that was just brilliant. So I, I think I fell in love with the people, with the community, with the idea behind it, you know, really putting this voice towards something, towards, well, development, maybe making things better in the long run. So I really love that. Um, and then that led me to get more and more involved. And at a certain point, I realized that there is sort of a hole that needs to be filled. And why not me? Uh, meaning now the diversity and gender equality role that I take part in now, the, the project group that I take part in, it started really after that first event, which I attended, we started talking with the community, what needs to be done still, what we would like to discuss next. Somebody came up with the idea of talking about women in our space and in, almost immediately, a group formed where people were discussing this. And again, people with different backgrounds, this time most of us were like engineers maybe people of science talking about you know humanities and how to empower women in the sector etc cetera, etc cetera. so one thing led to another we had one meeting another meeting another meeting and then we realized okay let's do a whole event about this and then i was attending these meetings and listening in and just you know it was really natural to kind of fill in um holes let's say in places where it needed to be filled so i was like i'm passionate about it let's just keep going let's just keep going let's see what, what it gives so yeah now two and a half years later uh or almost three years later now um yes i am very involved in this we have been pushing we have an amazing team so this keeps going and it's always evolving yeah, you mentioned some really incredible points there. I think the main one that you really brought home was interdisciplinary space is incredibly interdisciplinary. You can be coming from like any background, you know, like you were mentioning econ, arts, pure sciences, humanities, and you can all connect with the idea of space. I think that's what makes space its like own industry, its own place. You can literally, every career you're gonna need in the real world, you're gonna need in just the space industry. So that's really what I love about space, how it's so open and receptive to new ideas. And it just provides this creative place for everyone to just explore and you know think creatively and out of the box to you know, advance humanity. That's what I love about space. And I, I you know, thank you for bringing that point of how important interdisciplinary is and how regardless of what your interest is in, you can always come back and lead it to like some something related to aerospace. For sure, yeah. Yeah. And you know, in the SGAC, what in like the diversity group that you guys are doing, diversity and gender equality, what is like the number one goal that you guys have by forming this group? So it's really to give this topic a proper status that it deserves since i mentioned this is a huge it's a huge an organization as gc and uh, before we formed this project group there really wasn't a place to discuss this topic and this is about mm -hmm. bringing the workforce to a place where people feel included and welcome no matter what their background is we do focus we started focusing primarily on gender equality. Now we're broadening it into diversity as a whole and all of these aspects of diversity, of inclusion, they are really important to talk about and to try and implement some new strategies to achieve that gender equality and to make people feel welcome. So it's, it's really all about the people who work for the industry, in the industry, who want to get into the industry and just, um, yes making it more open really yeah and i can see you know your true passion for making and for advocating for gender equality whether it be through the work that you're doing or just like you talking right now about it i can really feel it and so i'm curious you know what was is there like a driving factor for you where it made you like really um you know passionate about bringing diversity or creating equity is there like a personal experience or just things you've read about maybe that have kind of shaped your thinking and your passion for really being a strong advocate for gender equality and diversity? Yes, I, I think originally, of course, it resonates with the fact that I'm a woman in STEM 
for me to get here was a process. It was a process even of moving physically from one country to another. And at first I didn't even think that I would pursue this career, this um, field really, for a number of reasons. And one of them being, yes, yeah, specifically there are some hindrances. It's, a, it's more difficult to project yourself onto this field when you come from a certain background. So from that personal note, I want to get to a point when I can inspire people, when I can empower people to get there if they want to, in order to try it, if they're interested in space. Um, for sure, that's the personal bit to it. But then to become a strong advocate, it takes time because at first, you, I think at first we are all a bit insecure, maybe in, to be really outspoken about it. And then when you find people around you who kind of empower you to get out there and talk about it, then it becomes easier and it becomes more natural. So if you ask me just now, why are you such a strong advocate for it? My initial reaction is to say, well, because it shouldn't be, it cannot be any other way. It should be equal. There should be equity, equality. Now it's so normal, right? But when I started, it was even a bit scary to talk about this, to speak up about this. So it started really from a personal place, but now it's more about the fact that, well, if we don't do anything about it, it will stay this the way it is, you know, right now. And I think it's unacceptable that still currently the space industry or the space workforce is a bit of an elite club. And uh, I think it's unacceptable. So if we're not going to do anything about it, it's going to stay that way. So the, the, the sort of the reason the answer changes with time, but it really starts with personal, of course, something like close to a heart. Um, and then it develops into this bigger mission, I guess, and vision. Yeah, and you know, that kind of leads me to two other questions that I have. And of course, you don't have to answer these. But, you know, a lot of times I heard like from my own personal experiences as well. And, you know, from friends and people I have met and talked with, they're always like, oh, because, you know, I'm a girl, a lot of people don't like believe in what my work is, or they're, or they say sometimes like culturally, they don't think that they're fit for the space industry, or some people feel the imposter syndrome or because they live in a different country, they believe they can't have the opportunities that you have in the United States. Um, there's just a lot of different factors, I guess, um, in terms of equity. It could be whether it's your gender or your socioeconomic status or even geographic location. And so were any of these problems um, ever present in your life as an obstacle? And if so, what advice would you give um, for others who might be like in a similar boat to what you had? I can share this. Um, I don't, I've never shared this before. Yeah, let's go. Um, for me, there is a clear distinction, connection. It will be, I, sh I should say correlation because it's not scientific, but uh, so I'm known notoriously for changing my hair, hair color. I've had all kinds of hair color. I've been blue, black, brown, blonde. This is a residue of blonde. It's been part of my change, my identity. And what I noticed and why I bring this up is that depending on my hair color, people will take me less and more seriously. And I've never shared it before because people think this is just something stupid that I've made this up and it's all in my head. But I've now read or read and heard several stories, similar stories. So when I've been blonde, I've been completely even taking kind of as silly or stupid in class. Like I started noticing it in class in engineering school, um, I would be sort of either completely ignored or on the opposite, given more attention as in, but do you also understand this? But you seem a bit like you shouldn't understand this, you know? Because I would be like, you know, yes, I am like this. I smile a lot, I'm like this, I'm blonde right now. Tomorrow I'll be blue haired, whatever. So the point there is that our appearances which are of course connected to our identity often do influence how people perceive us. And with a field where there is a lot of stereotyping, which shape how people think, how people act and how people even accept other people, these two things sometimes clash. And sometimes they let people to think that I don't belong or something is wrong with me or I should change. And the end of the story with the hair color is really that I was at some point considering, or actually throughout my whole life, I was always balancing between, okay, I accept going, you know, fully blonde with my appearance, with my hair, but I will dress up a little more 
like uh, in an assertive way, a little bit more male-like, to be uh, accepted and to be perceived as like um, more serious. And I did that. And now I regret it a little bit, or maybe not because, well, okay, that was a process I needed to learn from that process, you know? But I will never suggest that any to anyone. I will suggest embrace yourself and because you cannot change for other people for the for, for this industry, like for the way they perceive you, because that will change, you know? So you have to you have to keep doing you. One of the best advices I got was like, keep doing you, you know. Go, you know, go all the way. And and um because that's you that way you stay honest and true to yourself. So then I decided, yes, fine, I'll embrace, uh, you know, my feminine side, I'll, I'll wear my clothes and whatever, I'll do me. And because I'm still a professional, because I'm still serious about my work, because, you know, I still have a voice to give, to offer, and people will hear it better when I actually sort of wear it in an honest and true way. That's so empowering. I mean, thank you, first of all, for sharing that. I think it's a topic that people don't talk about because they think they're going to not be taken seriously, but it's a topic that we do need to discuss, whether it be hair or it be like tattoos or, you know, different types of clothing. It, there's a lot of stereotypes. And I honestly think in this day and age, we shouldn't be having stereotypes. You know, I've heard people saying when they're pregnant, people are like, oh, you know, they get the easier job. I mean, they're being considerate, but they're not asking them if that's what they want. They just make assumptions and they make stereotypes and they just go on with it. And I think that's completely false. And I think one of the main reasons I started Ignited Thinkers, or at least this interview series, was to break these stereotypes. Um, we've come so far and there's been so many women who broke so many glass ceilings, but there are still a lot of stereotypes that come into our minds. And, you know, it's just the natural, I guess, bias that we need to start being more cautious about. And, you know, thank you for bringing that to our attention as well as sharing that, you know, personal experience you had because it's your truth. And um, I think we all need to learn because I'm sure there is to this day so many girls out there or males who dye their hair and are, you know, given or assumed because of assumptions or stereotypes. Oh, if you have blonde hair, you probably are not as smart. That's, yeah, that's, there's a lot of stereotypes that need to, you know, completely go away. So thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. And so um, could you share, you know, I was mentioning how you are a PhD student. That's a lot of commitment, but also means you're doing a lot of research and some exciting, you know, work. And so I'm curious, um, could you share some of your cool research experiences or something that you're maybe currently doing for your PhD um, in radiation protection and engineering? And uh, maybe you can share like your most exciting project if you have one or just any, any research that you've done. I'd love to learn more about it. All right. So... What I do is I try to see how to use mostly regolith, which is the local material on the moon or on Mars. It's the, really just the soil that we find on the moon or on Mars. How we can use that material and maybe some other materials to build habitats for astronauts and how to protect them primarily from radiation exposure. And so what we do then is that we take the material, build some prototypes of that regolith wall of habitat wall, and then we can expose it to radiation here on Earth. So there are some radiation chamber chambers and some facilities which have radioactive sources. Mm -hmm. And we can put the prototype and then put that in front of a radiation source that will emit radiation. And then we will measure the dose before uh, the source hits our protection wall and after. So like that, we will understand how much is absorbed inside this wall. And like that, we can judge how well it protects, well, people in, in my case from radiation. And um, it's very exciting like that. And it's quite challenging because we cannot reproduce the full spectrum of radiation in space here on Earth. So what we have at hand is a couple of different sources which give off some different beams of radiation. And, uh, and then we can extrapolate from that information onto what happens like more on the case on the moon or on Mars. And then of course we complement with a lot of simulations. So the numerical simulations when we create this world and bombard regolith with particles and then what happens, we see what happens and then we calculate doses and so the risks uh, of exposure. One exciting thing maybe is that I, thanks to my collaborators, I will get to test some frozen cells. So the human organs in frozen, um, yeah, or frozen organ cells, 
which can be put protected by this regolith, by this wall, sort of like prototyping a mini, mini, mini habitat. And again, we put it in front of a radiative source and see what happens to these uh, cells. Primarily, we will look at dose attenuation and also at D DNA breakdown, because that's what causes cell mutations. And in case of uh, when the DNA cell cannot repair itself, it can cause uh, cell death. So one experiment that we have done is on a stratospheric balloon. That's when the balloon flies very high up into the stratosphere, where we have a higher pond of radiation than here on Earth. And we have also that little bit of that mix because we're getting many different particles. And so we get like a more diverse radiation environment up there as compared to in a laboratory here on Earth. So that's already like a one step closer, but it's not yet, of course, the radiation exposure on the moon, but already that's more like, let's say, exciting and more diverse. So we're waiting on the results from that experiment that flew this year. And that's exciting. We're maybe going to repeat that. What we did is we put a prototype of regolith and a regolith with another material. So we want to cross compare the two different prototypes, how well one did versus the other. And then repeat sort of, sort of these kind of, uh, sorry, these kinds of experiments on Earth with different radiative sources. Wow, that's really cool. So that kind of reminds me of a few research, research experiences that I've done. So last summer, I was an intern at NASA Ames Research Center, and we were analyzing um, Drosophila or like common fruit flies in space and how they like how their genes differ, especially like the cardiovascular system, how it differed in space compared to here on Earth. Um, and we like came up with an experiment we could potentially do. And so what we chose was how radiation impacts the cardiovascular system. And so I kind of saw some parallels and that's like genomics and biosciences and biology. And so I'm curious, is your research, what major would you have to take like for students who are interested in conducting this type of radiation research? Would you go into biomedical engineering, biosciences or physics or what, what is the correct path would you recommend from your experience for students to pursue majoring? All right. So I'd say there is maybe ideally there's no correct path. So there are different possibilities there. Like look at me, I come from purely engineering background. So I have several masters in different types of aerospace engineering. And then what I did is actually I pushed for this subject and sort of pitched it and found the sponsors, found the people to work with the collaborators. And then we put this project together in motion. So I don't have much of like this radiobiology science in my background from before. So then an engineer could do this. I think a radiobiologist could definitely do this because they will have much more background in this, uh, exactly like exposure to radiation, the risks, what happens to the human body, even in space in general. Um, a person who does particle physics, so more like the scientific, purely scientific background for sure could do this. Nuclear physicists could do this. So there are a number of different um, direct paths that I could see that people could do this type of work. But even I would say a person who is a bit multidisciplinary and has the certain level of background in engineering or in sciences or in the medical field could do this. But I think that really it's important to have sort of exposure to different disciplines with what I do specifically, because there is engineering, there is a little bit of radiobiology in it, there is a little bit of numerical simulations and experiments, a number of things. So it's really more the ability to turn your head to different things, look at everywhere and just grab the things you need and assemble them and do something with it. So yeah, I think a multidisciplinary background is more maybe valuable in this case. Yeah, that definitely makes sense to me. Yeah, of course, of course, a lot of scientific research is all multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary. So I can definitely see that coming. And, um, you know, when you were doing this radiation research, I feel like a lot of times people ask, what is the purpose of space or why are we investing so much in space? And it's because of its applications it has here on Earth. And so this radiation research you're doing for helping astronauts protect themselves from radiation in space. Do you see any practical application, medical applications or scientific applications here on Earth? Like, for example, maybe could your, um, you know, your product or your engineering design that you're doing help um, with like chemotherapy or, you know, cancer treatments? Or do you see other practical applications here on Earth other than just in space, just to show that parallel of how 
you know, space research help in our daily lives? Yes, for sure. I do think that the understanding of how radiation interacts with the human body on the cellular and organ level can definitely serve for radiotherapy, for the treatment uh, when we use radiation to actually cure and help the human body. Then when we're taking radiation protection, that's when we're trying to reduce the exposure and sort of maybe channel it in a certain way. That could, I think, help with rehabilitation after that radiation exposure. So even for people who work in areas where they are exposed to radiation, so in the nuclear field, for example, or people who fly like the crews that fly on high altitude uh, uh, flights for extended period of time, they are exposed to more levels of radiation and our doctors who are exposed to more uh, higher levels of radiation. So anything that we find out in radiation protection could serve these professions, these people to help rehabilitate their bodies or protect them better from their cert that certain exposure here on earth. And just to like kind of excite everyone um, for radiation protection in space, people are looking into some really extraordinary solutions. For example, there is a thing that's called now a radiation vaccine. So people are oh. looking for some really out there solutions which can then be brought back here to earth for example people are actually more or less radiation sensitive and some of these people may need radiation therapy for example or even to the on their daily exposure when they work in um again one of the things that i mentioned earlier so one of these types of people may need this or may profit out of this later we don't know yet it's really early stage research but there are really exciting things that are developed maybe initially for space and then they can definitely be taken to earth and vice versa actually yeah that's what i like like that's literally what excites me for space um so i really want to go into aerospace medicine i love the intersection between biology and space and you know trying to figure out how the different space environmental factors like microgravity um impacts the human body and helps us understand medical you know, the, our general understanding of medicine and the human body here on earth. And so that like correlation, the translation just really excites me. So I, I have never heard of a radiation vaccine before, but right after this, I'm going to be searching up about it because it sounds incredibly exciting. And, um, you know, that that's really cool. And I think that just that application, thank you for sharing that because I feel like people, a lot of times they're like, oh, astronauts, they're in space, nothing to do with me. But a lot of the work that goes on to helping astronauts get to space, will help us advance so much here on earth. And I think that's incredible. For sure. Yeah. yeah. And I feel like we haven't gotten to this question yet because I've been so intrigued by all the work that you're doing, but what was the aha moment or the moment when you realized that you wanted to get into some sort of aerospace career or research? You know, what was that moment that really excited you to get a part of the space industry? So I wanted to, be part of this industry, I guess, when I was really, really small. But back then, I took it as a faraway dream, unaccessible, and I really kept it to myself. I never shared it with anyone. Nobody knew that I dreamt ever of, quote unquote, bringing people to stars. That's what my thing uh -huh. was when I was six years old. But really, I kept it to myself and where I was born and where I grew up. I was very far away from the industry. And so it either meant moving away. And at that age, of course, I couldn't imagine that. And uh, so I completely kind of buried that dream till many years later, when I was already in another country. And when at the end of high school, we had this meeting with the student counselor or whatever, the person who's supposed to talk to you and ask you what you want to do next, you know? So we sat down for the meeting and the, the lady asked me, what do you want to do? And I said, I'm going to go into business. And she just said, why? And I was like, well, because my mom is a businesswoman, it's sort of like a legacy. I'm just going to keep doing that. And she was so brilliant to ask me, do you really want to do that? Why? She didn't just take that for an answer. And she asked me, but is that your passion? What are you passionate about? Because look at your grades, you could do anything. That's what she said. And I was like, okay, I've always been excited or interested in aerospace engineering. Like, to be honest, that was the first thing I looked up when I got internet when I was 11 years old. And I was like, who's that person who takes people to stars? That's how I Googled it or whatever the equivalent of Google was back then. I don't remember even. 
Um, so when I told that to the student counselor, she was like, yeah, but look, there are options for you. You could do it here. Because I was already in Stockholm in Sweden and there was a university where, we, where I went uh, and did that later. So that was the aha moment. Like I can actually do that, you know? That, that meeting with that lady was really revolutionary. So then I pursued it. I went 100% in, applied for that, still didn't tell anyone. And once I got in, then I told my mom, my friends, and everyone was like, where did this space thing come from? Because I had kept it to myself all these years. Uh, but then now, of course, I'm the space girl among my friends <laughs> and all that. Um, so yeah, that was the aha moment, that talking to someone. I think it's just that when somebody really in inquires into your real passion, what are you interested in? So we need that. We need these conversations, I think, with younger generation. And I feel like so many people can relate to that story. I think me included. So I personally didn't have a counselor, but I think educators are very important to helping you discover your passion, giving you that confidence. Um, like I was mentioning to you earlier, um, before our, our, like our interview started, I was saying how, you know, I got into space because of my middle school rocketry club teacher. He like, it, he was just, I took an engineering design class as an elective just to see what it's all about. And, you know, ever since little, I was curious about space, gravity, loved the space movies, aliens intrigued me. Um, I lived near Washington, DC. So I went to the Air and Space Museum. So all of that was part of my life, but I, again, never viewed it as an attainable career. And then I, my, I went to that uh, engineering design class and my teacher was like, Gitika, do you want to join my after school rocketry club? I was like, I don't think I could build rockets. I don't think I'm smart enough, but I was like, okay, sure. I'll try it because I, you know, I was like, why not? And I tried it fell in love. I would stay after school every day building model rockets for like three hours and I would use the laser printers. I would use the model rockets from SCs. I would cat it out. I would use rock sim. I like, I was in love with rocketry and I loved space and I started getting into it. I applied for a free NASA, inter NASA summer camp. It was called the Sisters Program at NASA Goddard Center and um, somehow got in and had a one week program at NASA for free with a bunch of other girls. So it was an amazing experience for me and it really solidified my love for space. But I feel like we had a similar story that there was like an educator or someone who really pushed us to that like point to discover what we love and be confident and bold enough to be like yeah this is what I want to do even though we never viewed it as an attainable career before um and that's really you know reaching to younger students is so important and so I'm glad that there was an educator there for you who's like is this, is this really what you want to do or do you like something else so I'm really glad that you had that person and I'm sure there's so many incredible teachers out there who are doing the same for their students I hope so too yeah yeah. And, you know, did you um, kind of like have obstacles to kind of pursuing aerospace engineering once you decided you were going to do that? And if so, how did you overcome those obstacles, whether it be, you know, like a geographic thing or maybe internship? I know you were also an intern at European Space Agency, which is really huge. So were there any obstacles? And if so, how were you able to overcome that? Well, as for obstacles, I guess this is just like the day to day things like um yeah, really reassuring yourself that you fit, that this is the right thing for you, that this passion is, well, let's say enough to carry you through because it is difficult still. Um, sometimes it may be a little bit, well, of a boys club. So sometimes, I, I mean, I didn't really have problems with that ever, but just like sometimes you start questioning it, <laughs> how much you fit and stuff like that. So these things probably are the sort of obstacles, if I should call them that. Then for moving around, then yes, of course, it's a, it's a very, I would say, still a small world, space world, and a lot of it is about connecting with people and maybe trying out internships or some jobs elsewhere. We cannot, we don't have the full industry in a single place, I would say. Like, so if you're interested specifically like in Mars exploration, which is where I started, then I have to chase it after it around, well, for me, Europe. But if I were more open to it, maybe the world, right? And this is where we start bumping into real obstacles. For example, nationalities. That's one of my personal obstacles that I had to face. And sometimes I couldn't do anything about it because the way it is structured is that some programs and some uh, opportunities are connected to where the money comes from and a lot of the money comes from the military 
um, at the defense ministry in a specific country. So then if you have the wrong nationality, but wrong in this sense, there may be no, not an opportunity, not an open opportunity, an option for you for a certain thing. Like I couldn't get an internship after my studies here in France because of that, it was hard to find an internship. And uh, so yeah, the options were limited. And I see that still with international students who don't have a European nationality, they are struggling to find internships and then go on to find jobs uh, within the industry, with the big companies where that chain of command stretches back to, well, the military connections and the defense. That's a big problem, I think, still. And I hear that when I work with SGC, I hear a lot of volunteers saying the same thing, that when they are immigrants from space developing nations and when they come to study in space faring nations then they don't have the option of pursuing a career there either they have to go back or make their own way or find some way around it this is really tough and it's close to hard to me because i had a real struggle with that and sometimes it's so far it's, it's hard to overcome it sometimes you gotta find another option you know yeah definitely and i think just like knowing that you do have a place and searching for those opportunities without giving up. Like I know for me, um, you know, personally, I haven't had those experiences, but when I was starting Ignited Thinkers, um, it was just an idea that I had. And I had to email like hundreds of people every day being like, oh, this is my idea. Do you think you can support me? Like I just, it was just putting it out there. Same thing for internships. You never know. And so just like putting it out there and kind of taking that shot and being like, hey, I'm going to just try applying and I'm going to see where I get it or if there's opportunities in these different companies and just never letting go, I think is very important. So I'm glad that you brought that problem to light and are acknowledging it. Yeah. And, you know, one of my um, one of my final questions for you is uh, what excites you and what makes you nervous for the future of the aerospace industry? So what excites me is probably, it uh, must be human exploration of the moon, <laughs> and Mars, of course, <laughs> and the whole, our steps towards commer commercialization and opening up the global arena of space, that excites me. Also, the idea that we have a lot of more new players coming into the space arena, so the space developing nations, and I do hope that they will take their fair place in the decision making, especially when we're talking about human exploration of deep space. I think it's crucial that everyone gets a say in what should be like the next space policy, etc. So that excites me because, of course, for me personally, space has always been a place where people come together. There are no borders and it shows it shows. I mean, for me, the ISS is a manifestation of the fact that we don't have to care always about our differences and our borders and all that. And people can work together and produce amazing things for the better life on Earth and in space. So I can only get more and more excited as so like a snowballing effect. What's <laughs> Moon going to give? What's Mars going to give in this sense? You know, the collaboration, the cooperation and just really the manifestation of the human a genius, I guess, and that international ability to co cooperate and build something amazing. So I do hope that this will be the general trend of being more open and inviting. Um, what makes me nervous is still the persistence, the resistance uh, to exactly being more inclusive and being more okay with us just being simple, like humans, in a sense that this is a beautiful sector, but I see a lot of people portray this kind of idealist image of people in the sector, just, you know, best grades, but all, the, all those, these prices, like acing everything, being the best at everything, and just going through life doing a hundred things, no burnout, no nothing. And like, you know, <laughs> and I think that, that makes me nervous a little bit because I don't think it's the true image. I mean, um, we're all still humans. We all still have struggles. And uh, like, I think, I hope we start accepting that more that side of diversity we're not just all like sort of super 
overachievers, uh, even though we are, but it's still okay to be human, to relax, to watch Netflix and all that. And I think if we're more honest about that, like the struggle, the there may be some personal things that come up as we strive towards that perfection and towards that, let's say, Mars exploration. If that's accepted, it will be easier, I think, to be part of this sector. And then we maybe will have less, um, we will lose fewer people because that concerns me a lot that, for example, if we talk about women, we are losing a lot of women in the workforce after five, 10 years of women being part of this workforce, we lose a lot of them, even after going through the, you know, the hard studies and the schooling, starting their careers, lifting up their careers to great starts, women go out of this and they quote the environment being too toxic and non-inclusive. That's why we're losing a lot of women. And I'm thinking a lot of diverse sort of this untraditional backgrounds that we will be losing them still. So that concerns me a lot. And I think we need to open up, be more inclusive, be more simple. <laughs> and then people will stay more and longer, I hope. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. I think, uh, first of all, I'm very excited about, you know, space opening up and commercialization, but also the, I think you bring up uh, excellent points with what we should be nervous about um, and in terms of being open with the struggles. And I think, you know, what I'm really trying to emphasize for the interview series is really just showing that to get to where people are, there's a lot that they did, a lot that they went through, and they have similar experiences like us. I mean, I can look at like someone's LinkedIn page or, you know, literally your co-lead of an SJC group, like that's pretty, that's really big. And just seeing all the accomplishments you did, you're a PhD student, like from the outside, I can be like, wow, she, she's like so surreal. She's like, whoa, like unhuman. But really when I'm talking to you, um, I can connect with you and I can see that you still, you went through what I have, I'm going through right now. And that's kind of how you became who you are today. And so just seeing that like reality and that truth also is just so empowering and shows that anyone can be a part of space. And of course the stigma, oh, you have to be a rocket scientist to go into the space industry. Oh, you know, you have to be amazing at math and physics. And like we were stressing the whole interview, space is so interdisciplinary. So you don't have to be like a math major. You could be an art major and be excellent and very essential in the space industry. Um, so again, just breaking those stereotypes is so critical and trying to create a less toxic environment um, so that people of all backgrounds can feel welcome and inclusive is a large goal. It's obviously like we're a long way from it. But I think taking these steps to talk about it, being open and just having these meaningful conversations and initiatives like SJC is having, I think is going to be critical as we expand, you know, and get make space a little bigger and more, um, you know, collaborative together. So I definitely thank you for bringing those points up because it's definitely something that we need to think about as we move to the future of the space industry. And so um, my last and final question for you, which I ask every interviewee um, is, I know you kind of given plenty of advice throughout this interview, but if you have to kind of travel back in time and think of yourself when you're in high school or college, you know, what final piece of advice would you give everyone? Something that, you know, when they're pursuing a space career, STEM career, really just any career, something that you wish someone told you when you were in high school or, you know, undergraduate college, um, you know, something that you wish someone told you. Don't be afraid to reach out and ask for advice and questions, for sure. Because I was afraid of that for a long time. And once I started doing that, I really got great answers and great advice. Just think that, just know that people are there and they love giving advice. <laughs> I, I, I'm convinced people love giving advice in general, uh, but especially people in the space industry are generally people who are so passionate that they love to spread this passion and share. So if you're interested in something in particular, anything, try to go find people, especially now with the digital age and like the accessibility of information, there is a chance that you will find someone who's doing something similar to what you're interested in. So reach out, but make it a meaningful reach out because just today I got a message saying hello from someone. And I mean, it, if you try to reach out to someone, try to make a meaningful connection. Say, hello, I, my name is this, and I'm interested in this. Could you tell me more about this? You know, build this connection when you reach out to people. And then that will be 
fruitful for you and you'll find some answers and you'll find some ideas and then try 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 to get your hands on something either it's an internship or project or anything you can do yourself at home because we don't all have the same resources and accessibility to resources so anything you can try out for yourself even maybe just to read and to see if you understand if you're still interested in something do that because you will maybe change your direction and it's totally okay to change your direction you don't have to stick with one thing and like go fully into it tomorrow you may from rocketry end up with i don't know mars exploration rock geology anything and everything is fine but you have to get there by trying by talking to people by trying something out for yourself and just sticking to what you like 100 percent. thank you for that incredible advice i think definitely the part about networking and reaching out to people i can 100 percent vouch for that um not knowing any anyone from the space industry to this day i think i've over interviewed over 90 space champions in the industry. And this was all through social media. So using Twitter, LinkedIn, I mean, you responded just off of a LinkedIn message. Once I explained my initiative, you were so open and receptive to this. And, you know, just seeing how people are just so open to helping others out. Um, it just makes my day. And I learned so much from every single conversation, including the one that we had today. And so I can vouch that people will reach out on LinkedIn if you ask them for something. I have received a few just hello messages. And of course, these are not as fruitful, but just kind of reaching out to people who have similar careers that you're looking into or careers you want to learn about and just asking them questions. I'm sure they will have a few minutes to just help you out because they were in your shoes at a point of time. So, you know, just trying everything and being open um, are great pieces of advice. And I know I will carry this with me as I continue into the future and go to college next year and beyond. So thank you so much for your time today. I had a wonderful time speaking with you. I know this was way over 30 minutes, but I just, our conversation was so fluid and awesome. I just loved having um, our conversation together and speaking. So thank you so much for your time and just responding off of a LinkedIn message. I really appreciate that. And I will put you, all of your socials in the description so people can reach out to you. Thank you so much, really. And I really appreciated how you shared as well. It was really fun for me to get to know you. Thanks so much. Thank you.